Can anyone tell me the name of this man you'll see in a moment? Anybody know? Who? Regis Philbin. Remember him? Eleven years ago, he became the first host of a TV um, show called Who Wants to Be a Millionaire? When I saw that title, I thought, dumb? Why would you name a show that? Who doesn't want to become a millionaire, right? I mean, it's a dumb question. I mean, we all would love to be millionaires. I think of an old grandpa who bought a lottery ticket. He was a Baptist, so they get, they're eternally secure. So he bought a, a, a lottery ticket, and um, he won. And the call came to his daughter, who uh, was concerned that he would uh, take the shock and maybe have a heart attack and die when he heard the news. So she tried to figure out how she was going to tell him he was a millionaire. And uh, she thought, oh, the pastor's used to telling news to people. I'll call him. And she did, and she told him the story, you know, my dad bought this ticket, and, and he has won, and we're afraid that when we tell him this, he's going to have a heart attack and die, and we know that you have a way with words, and maybe you could come. He's sure, I'll come gladly. So we stopped by in the afternoon and sat with Grandpa for a while and talked, and he said, Grandpa, by the way, if you were to receive a million dollars, what would you do? And Grandpa said, I'd give it all to the church. At which point the pastor had a heart attack and died. <laughs> oh, we all want to be a millionaire. And so I, I looked at that, but, but you know, with, who wants to be a millionaire? You, can, you might want to be, but you have to answer some trivial questions and so forth. And uh, I thought, where did they get this idea, this kind of a title for a TV show, and I think I found out this week. I think it was in James chapter 3, verse 13. Look at how he starts this passage. Dumb? He says, who is wise and understanding among you? Well, we all would like to think. We all think we're wise and understanding. It's kind of a dumb question. But he then, you know, with who wants to be a millionaire? Well, you have to answer some questions. James asks this dumb question. Of course we all. And then he tells us, well, if that's so, you want to be wise and understanding, then here is what you have to do. And so the rest of the passage we'll see this morning is telling us what we need to do if we do want to be wise and understanding. Now, we're in a series of James. Uh, now and then we get back into it, and we kind of been building it with building blocks. And just by way of re review, we started with the foundation of hope in Romans, and then we saw how hope is developed in the book of James. Our blocks have been knowledge, wisdom, trust, self-control, self-control part two, genuineness, impartiality, change, words, and wisdom. Imagine yourself being one of the recipients of this letter. You knew James. He was your pastor in Jerusalem. Now you're scattered, and James writes you this letter. You haven't seen him for a while, and he begins right near the beginning of the letter talking about wisdom, and he goes on to all these other subjects, and then all of a sudden he's talking about wisdom again. And your response might be, oh my goodness, James, I wonder if he has the beginnings of Alzheimer's. He's, he's forgotten he's already written about wisdom. Does he have an early stages of dementia? I don't suppose they had those words, but you know, what is wrong with him? He's, poor James is forgetful. He's repeating himself. And uh, we would estimate, since he was the brother of Jesus, that probably at this point in time, he's in his 40s and he's losing his mind. And you can see how concerned they would be. Well, the reason they might be concerned is because they don't understand. The passage before us is not a passage about wisdom. The word wisdom is used but it's a passage about character. In our uh, spiritual formation here, as building block after building block, there's a building block here of character. What is Christ-like character? And it's related to wisdom. For example, wisdom 
involves character or character involves wisdom. We see that in verse 13. Here's a dumb question. Who is wise and understanding among you? Then he begins to make sense. Let him show it by his good life, by deeds done in the humility that comes from. That comes from what? Wisdom. So he's talking here about humility or whatever that might be. It's interesting in the NIV today, we have the word humility. In the King James Version, it's meekness of wisdom. In the New American Standard Bible, it's gentleness of wisdom. And in the New Living Translation, it is goodness. He's not talking about wisdom. He's talking about what wisdom produces in the life of the believer. So how wisdom causes us to take on the characteristic of meekness. You might say, what? Meekness? Meekness is not weakness. So we might look at the word meek. Who wants to be meek? We want to be big and strong, but meekness is not weakness. An example of that is Moses, as you'll see here from Numbers 12, verse 3. The RSV here is the real revised standard version, not the reverse Stensether version. It reads there, Moses was very meek more than all men that were on the face of the earth. He certainly wasn't a weakling. He was a great leader, powerful man, but it says he was meek. In Matthew 11:29, Jesus said, I am gentle, that's the word for meekness, and humble in heart. So Moses and Jesus were not weak personalities. They were strong. They had that meekness that made them strong. In fact, it's rather interesting. In, in the university days, I studied classical Greek, which is a little bit different from biblical Greek. But in the classical Greek, meekness is used to describe like tame animals. It would be like a, a lion, someone is tame. Well, the lion is extremely strong, but it's strength under control. Uh, weak, meekness would describe a soothing medicine, or a mild word, or a gentle breeze, uh, uh, wind may not be gentle, but he's talking about a gentle breeze. In fact, Barclay in his commentary says it's a word with a caress in it. It is a beautiful, highly desired characteristic. And James talks about that here. That wisdom, if you are wise and you use the wisdom from God, it will produce that kind of a spirit in you. The spirit of meekness, and remember meekness is one of the fruit uh, listed in the fruit of the Spirit. So uh, what uh, are we to do to become a person of character? Two things. First of all, this morning, we need to avoid wisdom from below. This would be human wisdom. It's man-made wisdom, and man-made wisdom is destined to failure. And you see that. James warns us about that. You'll notice, uh, first of all, here in verse 15, the foundation of uh, this wisdom from the, the human or wisdom from below. We read in verse 15, it's earthly, unspiritual, of, and of the devil. Uh, interesting as you read this uh, in the Greek or here, it's an ascending order of negative strength. For example, first of all, you have the word earthly, which really means the source of this wisdom comes from our earthly culture. Then you begin to ascend in negativity, and secondly, it's unspiritual, or it's natural as opposed to spiritual, the mind of a deprived person, uh, human. It's the word um, from which we get psychology, suke here, or psychology. It's the idea of a man's own emotions and man's own ideas. Psychology, I made, minored in that, and uh, we were told at that time the definition of psychology is a study of the id by the odd, and uh, I believe that after the professors I had in the psychology department. But he's talking here about psychology, that our, our own wisdom is our own thought and our own mind, which usually is pretty confusing. And then he ascends to more negativity, and he says, and for, thirdly, it's of the devil. He's going back here to the story of Adam and Eve. And basically, um, Eve is out there, the devil approaches her in the form of a serpent, and he says, you know, uh, you're not supposed to eat of that tree of life, remember that? But if you do, you will be wise. You'll be as wise as God. And so this whole human wisdom, 
we see developing in the Garden of Eden from the devil himself. And the indication here is basically human wisdom is demonic. As someone has said, man unlocks the secrets of the world, but then doesn't know what to do with them. Our, our minds are not strong. I mean, we really don't know what to do with them. I'll show you a picture of a fellow here. Did you ever meet him? Well, probably not. Anybody here recognize him? If you were an English major or maybe at the university, you might recognize that picture. But most of us who've been through high school English will recognize his name. Thoreau. Remember Thoreau? Henry Thoreau. He was uh, the man who had the Walden Pond experience. For two years, he went and lived in a little cabin all by himself to think. So for two years, he's thinking, he's a philosopher, transcendentalism, uh, but he would think and think and try to figure things out. For two years, he lived in the little cabin and just thought about humanity, thought about everything, and here was his basic conclusion. We have improved means to unimproved ends. That is so true. The Walden Pond experiment simply proved that man's wisdom is very negative. Now, going back to verse 14, James shows us the function of this basic uh, qualities of wisdom. He says in verse 14, but if you harbor bitter envy and selfish ambition in your hearts, do not boast about it or deny the truth. He's working here from the inside out. He begins with the Suke again, the mind, the psychology, and as you watch these words, he goes from the inward to the outward. He begins, first of all, with bitter envy, that root of bitterness that oftentimes is within us. He then moves on to selfish ambition. People thought he was thinking of the Greek politicians who always were out to get votes for themselves. And then he uses the word boast or arrogance, meaning justifying my sinful actions. That's how all of this um, unwise wisdom functions. Root of bitterness, selfish ambition, and finally, we just justify our actions. Now, notice finally here the fruit of the result of all of this in verse 16. You will find disorder and every evil practice. Isn't that interesting? Disorder, human wisdom will lead to disorder or confusion. Uh, look around you. I heard a very secular person on the radio this week, wasn't on our station, who was saying that um, the, you know, what a mess our world is in, an absolute confusing mess. And of course, we've gone with humanism now, we will listen to human wisdom, and we are in a mess, we are confused, and James taught us that. And he says, along with this disorder this comes every evil practice. And just think what we're doing in our society. We're taking evil practices and we're now legislating, we're now uh, making them, taking them, uh, the restriction away and, you know, go ahead and practice, smoke what you want to smoke, marry who you want to marry. And we see all of this uh, evil practices because we're operating in our culture by human wisdom. In fact, the military slang sums it all up. Snafu. Remember that word? Anyone use that word? It came out of the World War, I think, too, and it's a military slang that means situation normal, all fouled up. That's a normal situation today in our world. It's all fouled up. Another slang, military slang, was fub, which means fouled up beyond belief. And that's exactly what wisdom from below will do for you. An example of wisdom from below, so to speak, or bad wisdom and good wisdom comes from the life of Roald Amundsen. You look at that man, you say, wow, is he good looking? And that's because he's Norwegian. Uh, aren't we all look how handsome he looks? And uh, he was a Norwegian um, explorer, you may remember from your history. He was the first person to reach or explorer to reach the South Pole in 1911. And the reason he uh, reached that is because he avoided unwise wisdom that he learned from Sir John Franklin, because Franklin tried to find the search or search for the Northwest Passage long before Amundsen. In 1845, the Royal Navy Rear Admiral Sir John Franklin left England to try to find the Northwest Passage. 
In fact, it's interesting. He took with him 138 specialty, specially chosen officers, two three-masted ships, but had auxiliary steam engine and 12-day supply of coal. He took 1,200 books with him, an organ, a full elegant place setting for everyone, included the most expensive china for 138 people, the most expensive crystal goblets for 138 people, and the sterling silver of the finest, 138 place settings. And uh, he set out to find the Arctic, and um, they never heard from him again. Over the period of time, they found some bodies, and at one point, they found uh, on some little island somewhere a bunch of bodies clutching sterling silverware. Now, as you look at that list, what was really unwise about that? Why would we use that as an example of wisdom from the below or human? You see anything that he did wrong in that list? Well, the answer is, notice, 12 days supply of coal. 12 days to find the Northwest Passage? I mean, what was the guy thinking? Well, he must have been Swedish, and the Norwegian, Amundsen, <laughs> learned from that. And so when Amundsen in 1911 set out, he took massive amounts of coal. He took the money that was spent in China and silverware and goblets and bought coal with it. And he found the, North, the South Pole. Kind of an interesting example of wise versus unwise. And that's kind of what James is comparing here. People living unwise, doing foolish things, ungodly things, versus those who are following Christ. And he does that by, first of all, telling us to avoid wisdom from below, verses 14 through 16, and then apply wisdom from above in verses 17 and 18. Its foundation is seen in verse 17, but the wisdom that comes from heaven, it's a heavenly wisdom, and you'll find that the wisdom of the world and the wisdom of heaven are literally worlds apart. And uh, like... It's very, very different. For example, in the United States, uh, just in our language, we are worlds apart in the West Coast versus the East Coast. Now, we lived on the East Coast for a while, and, and we immediately see the difference. When I got to the East Coast, someone said, oh, I got a new idea, Pastor. Pardon me? I have a new idea. You have a new eye of a deer? But out there, I mean, we have an idea here. But they have ideas out there. Totally weird stuff. Totally worlds apart. Um, we went shopping to the grocery store, and as we came in, someone said, oh, would you, do you have a carriage, or would you like one? And I began thinking about a carriage. That's Cinderella. Remember that? She wrote in a carriage, and they had all these horses. And I said, no, I don't have a, a car carriage. Well, would you like one? Yes, I would. So they brought what I call a shopping cart to me. Worlds apart, totally different language. Uh, I had my first funeral, and the funeral director called me, and he said, well, bury Mr. So-and-so on, on Thursday at 2 o'clock, but he'll be laid out 9 to 5 on Wednesday. Laid out, what does that mean? 9 to 5, what do you do after 5? Sit up. <laughs> now here, we call it visitation. And if, sometime, if you have, you go to one of those visitations and try to hold a conversation with a corpse. See how far you get. I mean, we're pretty dumb characteristic ourselves, but, but we're used to visitation. There it's laid out. Totally different worlds, different language. And that's what happens here. There's a difference between the human and the uh, heavenly language. For example, I kind of show that here. Wisdom, human wisdom, you have words like um, earthly, we just studied, unspiritual, of the devil, bitter envy, selfish ambition, boast, disorder, every evil practice. But now the language changes. When you have heavenly wisdom, it's pure, peace-loving, considerate, or consideration, with submission, it's uh, full of mercy and good fruit, it's impartial, it's sincere, it's righteous. You can just look at those words, and you see we're talking about a totally different world when we talk about 
wisdom from above. So he begins by talking uh, about the foundation, but then he goes to the function. How does that function? Verse 17, but the wisdom that comes from heaven is first of all pure, then peace-loving, considerate, submissive, full of mercy and good fruit, impartial and sincere. He's again working from the inward psyche there, but now we have the inward psyche or the mind filled with the influence of the Holy Spirit. And therefore, the behavior is going to be totally different. The language will be different. By the way, when you look at that, um, that, that phrase there, do you see anything odd about the punctuation? I, I remember looking at that as I was studying the passage this week. But the wisdom that comes from heaven is first of all pure, then peace-loving, considerate, submissive. Uh, first of all, see Peace, loving, comma, considerate, comma, submissive, comma, full of mercy and good fruit, comma, partial and sincere. Do you see what's different, though, about that? L look at the word pure. Why isn't there a comma after that? You'll notice that after pure, you have the uh, semicolon. It's different than all. Why would that be? And what the translators are trying to do as they take this from the Greek is to show there's a difference between pure and all the rest. A pure becomes the foundation for everything else. And so if you're going to build it, this is how you do it. Purity and everything else follows from purity. Now keep that in mind as we look briefly here. Pure, when we talk about pure there, it means moral pureness or the cleansing we have from Christ, but also like we might call devotional purity or how we work that out in a Christ-like life. Peace-loving, man is always in competition with each other, aren't we? But not as the believer, we find God's peace. We are considerate. There is submissive, that means open to reason. We're not defensive. If we're walking in the Spirit, we're open to reason. Verse 5, we're full of mercy and good fruit. Full there in the Greek means controlled by. We're controlled by mercy. Impartial means steady or not double-minded. We don't say one thing and do another. We're, we're not going back and forth like the waves of the sea, doubting and not doubting. There's a steadiness there. And then we're sincere, which means unhypocritical. That word comes from the Greek theatrical world, and that word looks like this. Here you have a picture of an actual theater mask worn by a Greek hip, um, hypocrite, hypocrite, really, is our translation, or actor. The uh, Greek word for a, an actor is hypocrite because he wore a mask, and you never saw the real person. And this mask is from a tragedy, an actual mask used when they did put on a tragedy. But when an actor acted in the Greek theater, uh, oftentimes he might have three or four roles in the same play. And so he might be, have a, this uh, mask you see now, there's aspects of tragedy. Then he would go off and put a happy mask on, a comedy, and come back. And an actor might do a number of parts and say there's ten actors in a play and one man could do seven. Then the, when they divided the money... They'd only have to divide it in five, not in ten. You make more money, the more masks you could wear and the more roles you could play. But you hid behind the mask, and that's how we get the word hypocrite. A hypocrite is something like a Greek actor who hides behind the mask and you never see the real person. He has something to hide. This last week I met with a couple um, students and interns in ministry, and they um, asked me, well, well, what's the one or two words of, of the best advice you could give us, and I said, be transparent. That's the mo If you can be transparent in the ministry, God will bless everything else. Don't hide anything. And in this uh, list here of heavenly characteristics, he, it builds really, and most of all, be pure and sincere. Don't hide behind any mask. Keep yourself open. No secrets. This next picture you probably can recognize. It's the silhouette of uh, what character? Sherlock Holmes. 
Well, you all recognize that. Let's see if you can recognize this next picture. Anybody? Without this man, you wouldn't have Sherlock Holmes. Uh, this man's name is Sir Arthur Conan Doyle, a brilliant writer, a man uh, who um, was sort of mischievous. At one point in time, <clears throat> he took the 12 most flu influential or greatly influential people in England, and uh, he sent them a telegram. And he was made sure that they didn't know who it came from. It was just this telegram to these 12 influential, respected people in primarily London. The telegram read like this. Fly at once. All is discovered. And he said within 24 hours, all 12 of them had fled the country. Isn't that interesting? They all had something that were hiding. They all had some masks, and for fear of whatever, they got out of the country. Wisdom from above says, don't have anything to hide. And if the, your life begins with purity, it'll build from there. Purity, peace-loving, considerate, submissive, merciful, good fruit, impartial and sincere. Be transparent. He ends now with the fruit of that kind of uh, foundation and function. He says in verse 18, peacemakers who sow in peace raise a harvest of righteousness. Incredible. Righteousness there is the fruit, obviously, of your life of wisdom from on high. And then it says peace. That's how the fruit is grown. It's grown in peace. I remember almost, what are we, 33 years ago now, this coming summer, coming to Turlock and uh, meeting a peach farmer. I love peaches. My mother used to can peaches. I said, wow, you actually grow peaches here. And he said, yeah, you come by the, the peach farm, a peach orchard, and I'll, I'll show you how they grow. And I'll always remember that warm afternoon in about July of that year, or August, sometime around then, going out into the peach orchard. And I, I, I just can't tell you how aggravating all the noise was. You go out there, and there's this massive noise, and the guy was, you know, driving one of these little carts, and he was trying to explain things, and he's hollering to me, you know, blah, 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 and the peach, all that noise from those trees and everything. And so then I would say, you know, what? Repeat that. And uh, you almost needed earplugs when you're out in that peach orchard because the peaches are so noisy when they are growing. It's, uh, it's, you just, have you ever been out there yourself? It's terrible all that horrible noise. And you say, well, are you kidding us? Well, of course I am. It was one of the most peaceful experiences I ever had. Next to that was being in the Garden of Gethsemane on an evening, beautiful peace, and the second one was being in that peach or orchard on an afternoon. Quiet, peaceful, and all the peaches were growing, all the fruit was coming up, but it was a peaceful experience. And that's what he talks about here. When you're following wisdom from above, ultimately it's not disorder like we saw with wisdom from below or confusion. It's peace. It's a peaceful existence. And again, not only meekness, but peace is part of the fruit of the Spirit. The ultimate fruit is peacefulness. Wisdom produces character that is absolutely peaceful. Well, in conclusion, we might ask the question, well, how do I get wisdom from above that will produce a meek characteristic in me? How do you get that? And actually, James gave us a hint back in our very first chapter, verse 5, where he said, if any one of you lacks wisdom, he should ask God, and it will be given to him. I read of a 
high, high school or college student that was seeking after God. And um, he, he wanted this wisdom that James talks about. And so he thought, well, how, how do I get it? And somehow someone said, well, you know, you have to let God do it. It comes from God. So he made a plaque with um, letters, uh, thick letters that you glue on the plaque. And they, so he got these letters, and it simply said, let God. And he, he had that plaque sort of attached to the, to the door of his room, so when he would get up in the morning, Lee was in college, he'd be going out for the day. Before he opened his door, he would see that plaque, those thick letters that were glued on the plaque saying, let God, let God. Well, he tried that, tried to let God. And it did seem to work. Huh? So then came the question, how do you let God? How do you let God? And he was struggling with that one day. And uh, when he came back from class and walked in his room, it, the door was scraped against something, and he, he looked at, oh, it was one of the letters from his plaque had fallen off. And God had answered his question. How do you let God? This is how you let God. You let go. And that's so true, that if you, we really want that peace that he's talking about, we have to let go. And as I was looking at the passage this week, you remember the beginning of the function of wisdom from below was bitterness. And that bitterness ruined everything. And after a few decades of ministry, I find out that in people's lives, Bitterness is often the reason they aren't really enjoying life. For many of us, something happened in the past, and we can't seem to get rid of it. Every once in a while, we think of that, and we, it, we get mad all over again. And so we can't let God if we can't let go. And so you have to go back and deal with that root of bitterness. And once that's uprooted and cast out and God cleanses you, then you begin to know the character of meekness produced by the Holy Spirit and wisdom. Let me ask you, is there some root of bitterness today you need to uproot? And as you think about that, would you bow with me? Let's just take a moment in the light of what James has taught us today to make sure that we do uh, let go. Perhaps this morning there are some, someone has done you something sometime. There's been something that's happened in the past, and maybe the past is three days ago. But, but maybe it's decades ago. And, and you say, Lord... You know, help me, help me, Lord, to let go. And he will answer prayer. He will, he will give you the ability to do what's right. But uh, don't hang on to that anymore. Because if you want to be a person of character, a person of meekness, strength under control, you need to be ready to let go and let God. Would you please stand with me as we conclude? <clears throat> Father, this morning I thank you for your word. Thank you that sometimes it's so encouraging, and yet sometimes it's so challenging and convicting. And this morning we're encouraged because you transform lives. And we see growth. And we see the heavenly language that applies to our lives. But Lord, sometimes we let things bring discord between you and us. 
This morning, Father, I would pray that there would be many of us who would just uh, confess that bitterness and ask you to cleanse us from that and fill us with your spirit that we might only be people of peace but also of <clears throat> meekness, gentleness. Lord, we realize that <clears throat> you need to work in us before you can work for us and through us. And so, Lord, <clears throat> I pray today that you'll work in us and may we go from here seeking to be wise people, avoiding that wisdom from below, the wisdom of the world, and applying the wisdom from above this week in Jesus' name. And everyone said, Amen. Amen. Thank you for coming. I think I'm running a little overtime, but it was because of that long offering that we took today. <laughs> Have a good week. Have a good week. <clears throat>